I suppose I better <laughs> behave. We're going to get thrown out of here. Yeah, exactly. You better sit down, I guess. Yeah. 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 second night of Our Lady of Charity Parish Mission. Special welcome to anyone who's here for the first time, you're more than welcome. Anyone from outside the parish, you're more than welcome. Anyone not sharing our Catholic faith, we're all on the same journey. Everyone is welcome. Thank you, we have an extraordinary night tonight. At a certain point, we will be shutting the lights down. I think there'll be enough ambient light coming in for a while, but I'll be um, leading a meditation and saying goodbye to loved ones who have died. Did everyone get a candle on the way in? Yes, Father. Yes, Father. Okay. More importantly, did everyone get an envelope? Yes, Father. <laughs> <laughs> um, we do have a very, uh, a kind of a, a healing night, I think you'll find. It's a powerful meditation, and yet it's, it's gentle, and it's a healing meditation. And we have lots of people helping us out. Our procession gets a little bit longer each night. I'd just like to mention our Bible bearer, which was our symbol last night, will be carried in tonight by Pat DeVito. Our candle bearer, and it's a heavy candle. In fact, uh, Peter Cowell, who was carrying it in, he did 75 push-ups in the sacristy. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you can say he's the strongest man in the parish. He's going to be carrying in the long Easter candle. Our acolytes tonight are Betsy Manning and Marianne Dixon. Uh, we're helped by, uh, as well by uh, Deacon uh, Tim Maloney and our presider is Father Brian. And speaking of uh, Deacon Tim, <laughs> I did hear a story about Deacon Tim, but it's embarrassing and I don't think I'm going to share it. Oh. <laughs> 
unless you really wanted to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you know Baker Bear? Yeah. 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 Uh, Deacon uh, Tim went there today, and he went in the front door, and there was a, a resident there, and he said, Hi, do you know who I am? And the man looked at him and said, No. But if you ask the woman down at the desk, she'd be able to talk. <laughs> so he went down to the desk, and he was visiting a woman um, resident, and so we went up to her room, and she wasn't there, and he sat down because she was going to be coming back soon, and there was a bowl of almonds there, and he kind of hesitated, but then he took one, then he took a little handful, and took another handful, and pretty soon the bowl was empty, and he hid, he hid the bowl. <laughs> But when the woman came back into the room, he kind of fessed up and he said, I'm sorry, ma'am, I ate all of your almonds. And she said, not to worry, Dick and Tim. I only eat the chocolate on the outside. <laughs> That's why I wasn't going to say it. <laughs> I'm going to make all the announcements now because we have an open-ended ending, meaning we're going to be moving into the Sacrament of Reconciliation. Father Brian will be telling us where our wonderful priests that are helping us out tonight will be situated around the church tonight. Um, so I'll just jump ahead to tomorrow night. I'm glad you're here tonight, and perhaps you were here last night too, but you cannot miss tomorrow night. Tomorrow night is the best night by far. It's the top of the mountain. In fact, we're going to be taking your social security numbers and we're going to the church. <laughs> Now, tomorrow night, it's a very special um, closing Mass tomorrow night. And we will be asking if you could uh, take with you to the Mass tomorrow night an object of devotion from your homes to be blessed during the Mass tomorrow evening. Now, an object of devotion is anything that you hold dear. It could be a religious article. I suggest if you don't have a crucifix in your home, that would be uh, a good uh, religious article to take in to have blessed. But it could be anything, it could be a family photo, anything that you hold dear, bring it in, we'll bless it, and this blessing will continue to be a blessing for your homes and for your families. Now, on the topic of blessing, maybe the priest in front can correct me if I'm wrong, but there's two things, two articles that do not need to be blessed. Do you know what they are? Rosaries. No, rosaries can be blessed. One, it starts with a B. Bible. A Bible doesn't need to be blessed because it's already the Word of God. And the other is, and this is where I'm not sure, but a chalice. I don't think anyone's going to bring in a chalice. Um, but as soon as you say your first Mass, the chalice is blessed. Uh, so that's a little trivia question in case someone asks you that later on tonight. You will have an answer for that. So I think that's it. So we, we will be um, having a collection. I wouldn't be a good redemptorist if I didn't mention the collection, and we'll have a collection tomorrow evening, and uh, the envelopes say to make out the uh, check, if you were writing the check to the parish at Lady of Charity, and Father Brian will handle it from there. Notice I didn't say he'll take it from there, but he'll handle it from there. So thank you again for your presence, and we, we're in for a wonderful night. So please remain seated for our opening hymn, so you can better see the symbols as they pass by. And by the way, I did fail to mention Brian, your wonderful musician, last night, and I almost forgot it again tonight. But we just show our appreciation for Brian. He's just doing a fabulous. <laughs> and, and Brian, I just say that no one has ever left church humming a sermon. <laughs> so thank you. So please be seated.
sin and death be always with you and with your spirit friends in Christ we when our Lord Jesus passed over from death to life he scattered the powers of darkness and by the light of faith enabled us to see the glory to which we are all called we now ask God's blessing on these candles and pray that God will inflame us with the hope that brings us to the feast of eternal life Grab your candles, very good. Let us pray. God of all life and light, through our faith in the risen Christ, the light of the world, we share in the light of your glory. Bless these candles and make them holy. Fill our hearts with the light of faith so that we may walk clearly in the path of goodness. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our light, Amen. The Easter candle is a symbol of Christ. It is adorned with grains of incense to mark the wounds that Christ endured. The marks of Christ's sufferings are now the emblems of his victory. So shall he transform all our sufferings and reward those who are faithful to him. At this time you may be seated as our church lights will be turned off to allow the light of Christ to shine in our midst.
Jesus said, Blessed are they who mourn. In the Gospel of John, we read that Jesus was torn with grief and wept at the tomb of his friend Lazarus. His mother Mary stood under the cross of her son and watched him die. The apostles huddled in fear, confusion, and deep grief after the crucifixion of Jesus. Tonight, Jesus invites you to mourn with him. Grief and mourning are universal experiences. Every one of us has lost people we have loved. Sometimes we were so busy with burying our dead and getting back to our daily lives, we never took the time to grieve. Some of our beloved dead passed on before we ever had the chance to say goodbye. This is an exercise that may be helpful if you are having difficulty in coping with the loss of a loved one who has died. I invite you to breathe gently. and take yourself back to the moment before your beloved one died. No difference whether you were there or not. Jesus is taking you by the hand back to that time. Look at Jesus, who is with you. He sees and understands your pain. He puts his arm around your shoulder. He stands with you, beside you, and next to your loved one. Now, take a moment to speak to your loved one. Say whatever you didn't have a chance to say. Ask forgiveness if that is needed. Give pardon if that is needed. Take some time to speak to your beloved deceased the words that are in your heart. Hear your loved one speak to you in love.
then take your loved one's hand and put it in the hand of Jesus. Say, I am giving you to Jesus. He is not taking you from me, but I am giving you to him to live in his presence. I want you to be with Jesus. I hand you over to Jesus. your loved one's face. See how they look. He or she is happy to be with Jesus. They are radiant with joy, filled with peace. That's what you want for them. That's what they want for you. Peace with Jesus. Say, one final time, I love you, go with Jesus. Then let them walk into the light with Jesus. Jesus is the Lord of life. On Easter Sunday, he broke forth from the shackles of death. Jesus entered fully into death and was raised up by his Father. We too, along with everyone who has ever lived, are under the power of the resurrection. We are to live forever. We shall someday see all our beloved in the kingdom of God. Jesus is eternal life. We are a people of the resurrection. At this time, I invite you to stand with your candles as Deacon Tim leads us in prayers of petition.
my brothers and sisters, with joy in the risen Christ, let us turn to our God in prayer. And please respond to each petition. We are the light of the world. We are the light of the world. That pastors may lead in faith and serve in love the flock entrusted to their care. We pray to the Lord. We are the light of the world. That the entire world community may rejoice in the blessing of true peace, the peace Christ promised. We pray to the Lord. We are the light of the world. That our suffering brothers and sisters may have their sorrow turned into lasting joy. We pray to the Lord. We are the light of the world. That our parish community may have the faith and strength to bear witness to Christ's resurrection. We pray to the Lord. We are the light of the world. Let each of us now in the silence of our hearts, pray to our God, who knows the secrets of every heart. We pray to the Lord. We are the light of the world. Loving and beloved creator of all life and light, you offer to each of us the gift of faith. May we no longer live in darkness, increase our faith, so that we, who bear these candles, may walk in the light without fear of the darkness. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our light. Amen. Amen. And if you could just raise your candles for a simple litany. Jesus is the light, you can repeat. Jesus is the light. Jesus is the light. He is the light of the world. We are the light of the world. Jesus is the light. He is the light of the world. We are the light of the world. Jesus is the light. He is the light of the world. We are the light of the world. At this time, you may blow out your candles, but if, as our church lights come back on, but if you could hold on to them for a few moments until the wax hardens. Did I mention that our church lights can come back on? <laughs> I invite you to extend your hand of blessing towards Father Kevin. Heavenly God, your light is strength for us, your people. May your light fill Father Kevin's heart and mind to proclaim your forgiving peace and tender healing. Open our ears and hearts to hear and accept the gentle strength of your light and love. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our light. Amen. Amen. Good evening again, everyone. Good evening. I'd like to share with you tonight a most amazing story. It's a story that moves me whenever I hear it. And it's a story with which you're already familiar because it's in the Gospels, in John's Gospel, chapter 4. It's the meeting of Jesus with a Samaritan woman at the well. And as a very brief background to the story, I'd like to mention three points. The first, as you probably know, the Jews and the Samaritans had a history. <laughs> and by that I mean there were events in their past that affected their present. Way back in the 8th century BC, the Assyrians conquered Jerusalem. And in 586 BC, the Babylonians 
conquered Jerusalem and destroyed the temple and marched the survivors to long years of exile in Babylon. When they were finally allowed to return to their home and they began to rebuild the temple, the Samaritans who lived just to the north offered their help. But because the Samaritans had intermarried with these conquering tribes and adopted some of their religious practices, the Jews refused the Samaritans' help. And from that time on, a Jewish person never spoke to a Samaritan person. At least that's one side of the story. <laughs> Another point is that in Jesus' time, a man and a woman did not speak to one another in public unless they were husband and wife. And a man and a woman never touched one another in public, even if they were husband and wife. And finally, this Samaritan woman was getting her water under the heat of the noonday sun. Now, if you lived in a tropical country, what time would you get your water at the well? In the morning. Sure, in the morning before the sun got too hot. So the fact that she was getting her water at a time that she knew she would not meet anyone from her village speaks volumes. She had a past a scandalous past, and she did not want to be reminded of it. So keep those three points in mind as I share with you this most extraordinary story written by the famous storyteller John Shea. It's entitled, Anything Can Happen at a Well. <laughs> Let those who have ears to hear, hear this story. Those who have eyes to see, see the scene. Anything can happen at a well. The man who was sitting on the small stone ledge that circled the well slid off, turned to the woman who had just arrived, smiled, and said, I'm thirsty. She had seen him from a distance. She had stopped to readjust the yoke that straddled her shoulders, a bucket hung from each end. And if her steps were not perfect, and they seldom were, the wood of the yoke would cut into her flesh along the nape of her neck. She took the pain for granted, but from time to time she would stop to readjust the weight to more callous skin. From bruise to bruise, she thought. It was as she was straightening from her bent posture to gauge the last ground left before the well that she saw him. He seemed to be waiting for her. Her mind raced. She thought about turning around and making for her village, but if he wanted, he could easily overtake her and take what he wanted. Then she cursed. Why hadn't she come in the morning with the other women? She knew why. But even that humiliation would have been better than this danger. Then a plan formed out of her panic. She could see by his dress that he was a Jew. He would probably walk away after some quick insult or a great show of disdain. And if not, she could make him go. She would steel herself, hide her mind, harden her heart, she had done it before. It wasn't the first time. She knew how. I'm thirsty, the man said again. It was so blatant that it took her back. From a distance, she could manage him in her mind, but up close, his presence was almost too much. But she recovered quickly. Who isn't? This son would fry a lizard's tongue. Give me a drink. What? You, a man and a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan and a woman, for a drink? I have a simpleton on my hand, she thought. Thirst makes friends of us all, the simpleton said. I will help. Before she could protest, he slid the cover off the top of the well and stood ready for her bucket. 
I'll do it, she said. She dropped the bucket down the well. A splash rang up from below. She pulled the rope sideways till the bucket below tipped and filled. Then she pulled it up with quick, successive jerks. All the while, the man stood at her side. He said nothing. If he thinks he is going to be first, she thought, he thinks wrongly. This is our well in my bucket. He will learn who he is here. She rested the bucket on the ledge of the well, hunched over it, and splashed water towards her mouth. She drank like an animal that had been worked too long in the sun. And all the time she drank, her eyes darted from the water to the silent man at her side. He was smiling. The simpleton has missed the meaning, she thought. When she finished, she stepped back. The man did not move. She waited. Finally, she gestured towards the water. Slowly, the man cupped his hands and dipped them deep into the bucket and brought the water to his mouth, his head back and open to the sun. The water ran and glistened in his beard. He drank like a bridegroom, loving the first cup of wedding wine. With his mouth still wet from the water, he turned and said, if you would ask, I would give you living water. The well is deep. She felt like she were giving a child a lesson in logic. You do not have a bucket. Therefore, how do you propose to fetch the water? Yokes in buckets are always a problem, aren't they, said the man, in his arms flew up in the air in exasperation. A smile popped open her eyes, but her lips remained tight in disapproving. Not a simpleton, she thought, a child, just a child. The man changed the topic abruptly. Do you have a husband? The question slapped her across the face. Not a child, she thought, a man, just another man. I have no husband. True enough, he said, you have had mm, five husbands. And the husband you have now is not your husband. Do you have a wife? She spat back. <laughs> I have no wife. True enough, she said. And the woman you had last night was not her either. <laughs> he laughed as if someone had taken and turned him upside down. He seems to be enjoying this, she thought, but not for long. No, prophet, she said. The number's not five, it's twelve. I was never good at numbers. <laughs> One for each of the tribes of Israel, she said, and thought that should do it. Very pious, said the man, very pious. This time she could not catch the laugh in her teeth and swallow it back. It escaped and howled out loud like a prisoner finally free in the sun. You are a hard man to get rid of, she said, now not so sure she wanted him to go. Everyone says that, said the man. One more try, she thought, and this Jew, like every other man, will surely leave me. Tell me, O prophet, who is not very good at numbers, where shall we worship the living God? On the mountain? are in the temple. The man closed his eyes and grew silent. He seemed to be going deep within himself to some inner sanctuary. This is it, thought the woman. This is where in the name of the living God he will spurn me. When he opened his eyes, he caught hold of her hand and said, God's not on the mountain but in your thirst. God's not in the temple, but in the scream of your spirit. And it cries to me, ask me for a drink. 
Not just another man, she thought. Not just another man. She pulled her hand back. I don't ask, she said, as if her whole life were in every word. Even without a bucket, he said, if you would ask, I would give you living water. As they sat on the ledge of the well under the sun, they were silent. Finally, he reached for her hand. She let him take it. Give me a drink, she whispered. What? You, a woman and a Samaritan, ask me, a man and a Jew, for a drink? Thirst makes friends of us all, she said, and smiled. Then he took her hand in his and formed them into a cup. Together, their hand dipped deep into the bucket and brought a cradle of water to her lips. She drank slowly, her face open to the sky. She drank like a deer with the thirst of summer, like a field parched by drought, like a desert wanderer finally at home. With her lips still wet, she turned and said, sometimes the yolk in the buckets cut into my flesh so bad I want to cry out in pain, but I never do. I know. Then she told him all about her husbands, who were not her husbands. She told him everything she ever did. Everything she ever did, she told him. And all the time she spoke, she cried. When she finished, he said, I know. And then he told back to her everything she ever did. Everything she ever did, he told back to her. And all the time he spoke, he rubbed the nape of her neck where the marks of the yoke were the most punishing. It was after he had finished his revelation of her to himself that she saw the other men. His friends were returning. They will be scandalized to see me here with you, she said. Probably, said the man. I must go. She let go of his hand and moved gracefully away. She turned often to look back at him, and each time she did, he was looking at her. Even when his friends gathered around him, he stood on the ledge of the well and watched her. Finally, she was too far away to watch him watching her. Then she couldn't get to her village quickly enough. She went from house to house and told everyone that she had met a man who was more than a man, who taught her how to drink. It was after she had stirred up the entire village that she realized she had left her yoke and buckets back at the well. But for the first time in memory, she was not thirsty. The curious villages formed a circle around her, and she stood in the midst and said, I met a man who told me everything I ever did except for how many times. And she laughed high and long. Some of the villagers said it sounded like she had a fountain of living water springing up inside her. Let those who have ears to hear, hear this story. Those who have eyes to see, see the scene, anything, can happen at a well. Do you want to laugh high and long tonight? Like a desert wanderer finally at home? That is the invitation. It's the same Jesus tonight that met that Samaritan woman back at the well. It's the same Jesus tonight who knows that we carry our burdens around for far too long. 
So that's the invitation, that we get to lay this down tonight, that we get to walk away from St. Ambrose Church tonight with a new spring to our step. Now, right about now, you're probably thinking, huh, you know, I think he's talking about confession. <laughs> And it's been a long time, and we forget all those formulas. Well, we're going to make it very easy tonight. We're going to have a common act of contrition. We'll even have a common penance. And the common penance is this. Sometime over the next couple of days, perform a small act of charity. Now, I have heard Father Brian saying that his car is not running too well, but I'm going to leave it up to you a small act of charity sometime over the next couple of days. In the common act of contrition, I think we all know the penitential right now that we say every Sunday. Could we say that together? I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts, in my words, in what I have done, and what I have failed to do through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. And Father Brian's going to tell us where everyone will be for confessions. And just a reminder, We'd like you to stay and certainly to take advantage of the Sacrament of Reconciliation, to stay and pray, to stay and listen to the music. You have a wonderful music minister, but you are free to leave at any time. So thank you again for your presence tonight, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. For the Sacrament of Reconciliation, obviously with COVID, things are just a little bit different. So the priests will be all stationed up front. You'll notice uh, I will take the camera down and everything before confessions begin. Don't worry, I'll shut them off. Okay? But you'll notice the markings on the floor in the center. We'd ask everybody that is coming for confession to use the center aisle. Keep yourselves spaced apart. And if you can go to confession from front to the back, so we're not crossing one another. As a priest is available, we'll all be stationed in the front. We ask you to simply go to the next priest that's available if you have a favorite that you want to go to, step to the side, let the next person go. At each station, you're going to find there are sanitizing wipes and a little garbage can. When you're done with confession, just wipe your seat off real quick, throw it in the garbage can, and then you can go on your merry way. And I ask you to go down the side aisles as you're done. Okay? Good? Good. All right. And also, just please keep respectful silence and prayerful silence as we receive this beautiful sacrament. And when you're done, we ask you to please leave and depart in silence as well. I thank my brother priest for joining us tonight uh, to hear confessions. Um, so we have a number of stations uh, over here by St. Teresa. Uh, we'll be Father Bob. We know Father Bob Ora who helps out on Thursdays for my day off and on the weekend sporadically. So thank you, Father Bob, for joining us. Father Jim O'Connor, retired priest of our diocese, is going to be here in this side entryway. Right here behind me, uh, I'm going to invite him to come up for a second is uh, Father Martin Gallagher. And I officially received a letter in the mail uh, yesterday that Father Martin is our new associate at Our Lady of Charity Parish. <laughs> Father Gallagher has returned. <laughs> in a different way. <laughs> Much different way. <laughs> You'll learn, okay? But uh, we welcome Father Martin to our parish. He'll be beginning in October. Uh, October 2nd is your arrival, correct, Father Martin? All right. Uh, so he'll be hearing confessions right here. Um, I will be in the sanctuary. Father Kevin will be right over by Our Lady Perpetual Help. Monsignor Lupuma will be in the other side entrance. And then Father Chuck will be by St. Francis Xavier. Okay? All right. I invite you now to prayerfully prepare yourself for the Sacrament of Reconciliation.